tonight is going to speak on another topic, Hanyu uh, or Hanu uh, in Korean pronunciation, pronunciation, and why Koreans worship a Chinese folk seller. So let's welcome Jacko with a big round of applause. Thank you very much to Mr. Jan for the uh, excellent introduction. Uh, and thank you uh, for coming tonight. It's a very cold night uh, this winter, so thanks for coming out. This is actually my fourth talk uh, at the Royal Asiatic Society. So to any of you who have been before to my course and have decided to come again, thanks for being so patient. That's very kind of you. Right. Well, first of all, a word of apology. Uh, if you look at the uh, printout of the summary, which is also the same as what's on the uh, Royal Asiatic Society Korea Rose website, uh, I was um, careless in using the present tense, why Koreans worship a Chinese folk seller. Uh, careless or maybe deliberately provocative, whichever one sounds better. Uh, it would have been more accurate if I would used past tense, which is why here in this uh, title I call it, How Did a Chinese Folk Seller Become Worshipped as a God in Korea? So, because uh, these days, not that many people worship. But 100 years ago, or 120 years ago, it was certainly a lot more. So let's talk a bit about, uh, first of all, <coughs> defining my terms. What do I mean by worship? We've got this term here. It's a bit controversial to the word worship. Let's have a look at some of the words that are used uh, in this discourse that I've looked at. We've got the, the Korean word, the sumbehara, in Chinese, which is often translated in English as worship. We've also got chuanghara, to revere, to venerate. To adore, as in Wangar or Chuan Parata, to be venerated as a king. Yeo, which is respectful treatment. Dongwe Shin, which is reverence. Bohan Hada, to enshrine. Patilda, and the last three words here are pure Korean words. Patilda, Moshida, and Songida. Patilda means to respect, to revere, to look up to. Moshida, which is often used with uh, uh, parents, parents, people older than you, or someone of, of a high status to look after, also to serve. And it can be used together, these two words. So in the example of Moshioba, uh, and the last one, Songida, to serve, to take care of. And this word, Songida, is also used in the Christian context of to serve God. And so that's why I put it there as equivalent to Sumbeha, uh, which often has a, a worshipful uh, intention. Now, all of these words are used in the articles that I read in Korean about the character that I'm talking about today. So. Uh, Although it may not be the same kind of worship that uh, people of other religions to uh, ascribe to their gods, nevertheless, it's in that uh, in that vein. So let's move on to uh, a toku seller. Here's a, a postcard of a typical late Joseon dynasty toku seller. He's got the the chige on his back, and the blocks of toku would be in there, and he's going around selling it. Now that uh, is also a bean purse seller, because toku is another word for or is English transcription of the Japanese word for bean curse. Bean curse. Toku. And Jiangsu is a pure Korean word meaning a seller, a peddler, a trader. So this man would be a Toku Jiangsu, a Toku seller or Toku peddler. Now Jiangsu also has another meaning uh, with Chinese characters. Now Jiangsu can mean a general. A military general or a commander. And here we see the Chinese characters there, Jiangsu. Uh, there must be a pun there somewhere because this person who I'm talking about tonight was both a Tuku Jiangsu and a Munta Jiangsu. So he was a, a Toku seller and a military general. So the pun there could be perhaps the Jiangsu come down. Jiangsu. Pardon the Chinese. Okay. So, who am I talking about? Well, he's got lots of names. Here's a picture, or a picture of an action figure based on him. Uh, the Chinese name, you'll see there the traditional characters and the simplified characters which is uh, transcribed in the pinyin mode as Huan Yu, and in Wei Giles as the same, but with different pronunciations. Korean, his pronunciation, oops, and that's a misspelling there, it's a bad type, mistype that, that should be Huan. So part of my, uh, my ota, my mistyping, that's uh, Huan Wu is his Korean name, and in Japanese, Kanu, using a slightly different simplified version of the first character. He has a courtesy name, or a cha, which is uh, uh, in Korean it's uh, yun chan, but, or yun chan, and in uh, Chinese, uh, un chan, which means the, uh, uh, well, uh, un meaning cloud, and chan meaning long, or leader, or lord. But that doesn't include his posthumous name, his Buddhist name, his deity name, or countless other names. He has a heck of a lot of names, this character. So I'll just refer to him by the, the Chinese, that's the name that he's most commonly called by uh, in English. 
a, a, a likeness upon you. Uh, what we know about him is recorded in this book called Records of the Three Kings. I, I say it's a book, but it's actually many, many volumes, uh, written in Chinese around 280 AD, and it's uh, a record of that time when he was uh, uh, when China was vanished. So he's born into a humble family, farming family, around 162 AD, in the latter part of the Eastern Han or later Han Dynasty. And in his early years, he's said to have told uh, beans and all beans. Later, in Shuhan, one of the three kingdoms that was written about in the records of the three kings, this chap came to serve Yu Bei, uh, or uh, Yu Bi in Korean, who was a warlord, a state founder, and the first emperor of Shuhan. Right? So this is where we get from one type of Gansu to the other type. And so the, the, the Bean Curd really was just an early part in his early years. Uh, he spent most of the rest of his life as a general working under this warlord, Yu Bei. Now, <coughs> bear in mind, and you, you'll see here's the Shu Han is over here in the map, quite far from the Korean Peninsula. These are the, the three kingdoms. There's no evidence that Kuan Yu ever visited the Korean Peninsula. And as far as we know, he didn't even approach Mount Texas down here uh, to, uh, to look over into the, uh, the blessed land of Korea. So he's never come here during his lifetime. It's after he died that the uh, story becomes interesting and complete. So how did he become popular? This is still in China. We've got this Ming Dynasty historical novel called The Romance of Three Kings. That's uh, from around the 14th century, I think, when it was written. It's a novel, but it's based on the record of the Three Kings. So it's more or less a, a fictionalized portrayal of uh, the events from The Kuan Yu of this novel is much more famous than the Kuan Yu of reality. It's where we get most of the details about uh, who he was and what he was like. For example, we come to Kuan Yu's appearance. There's no description in the record of the Three Kings at all what Kuan Yu looks like. It's in the romance that it comes out, and I'll read it to you. Kuan Den took a glance at the man who stood at the height of nine chi, or 2.07 meters, a bit smaller than I am and had a two-chi long beard. His face was the color of a zhao, or a jujuben, a detru in Korean, with red lips. His eyes were like that of a phoenix's, and his eyebrows resembled silkworms. He had a dignified aura and looked quite majestic. And you can imagine that any man who was 2.07 foot tall, with a 50 centimeter long, almost 50 centimeter long beard, eyebrows like silkworms, and a very red face like a, a Chinese dame, he would be quite majestic. And he's also usually described wearing green robes over his arm. And this is why we see him mostly depicted as having a green gown. Okay, so his status rise mainly after his death. So uh, he was executed by a, a rival warlord, uh, but it was in his loyalty and uh, uh, military fidelity to his own warlord, Yu Bei. That's how he became famous. So after his death, his ranking began to rise. As I said, in life, he was just a mere he got the posthumous name of Maki uh, Zhangma. And uh, about 800 years later, 900 years after he was killed, during the reign of the Song Dynasty Emperor Chao Zong, he was established as Prince Zhangmao Yiyongwan Guan Yingqi, with a whole bunch more Chinese characters. Unfortunately, you can't see it very well uh, on the uh, projector. But you see that the name starts to get longer, and he's now gone from a marquee to a prince. Then Emperor Wenzong of the Mongol Yuan dynasty renamed him Prince of Chanlin Yiwang Wuan Jingji. It's almost the same. He's changed a couple of the characters there at the beginning. So it shows he's popular not only with the, uh, the Han Chinese, but also with the Mongol Chinese. The Ming dynasty then saw him elevated to saintly Emperor Huan. So he's now an emperor, and he's saintly, ruling from heaven. And the Qing dynasty went further. The holy and august emperor Huan, the loyal righteous of supernatural powers and spiritual perfection, whose benevolence and courage is majestically manifest all that year. That was his full title. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. So it was often shortened to Saint of War. Right? Wu Song, a common powers title for Huan Yu. And this is where we 
we see him, uh, his name gets connected to war, and he's a saint of war, but he's also a bit like a god of war. So upon you worship is kind. Well, let's just look at perspective here. We know that uh, Confucius, of course, is very important uh, in ancient China. So in pre-communist China, there were about 3,000 temples to Confucius. Uh, these temples are called uh, Gongniao or Gongnyo in, uh, in Korean. And we have one of them here in Korea at the uh, Songyongwan University. Now, there were 300,000 temples and shrines where Kuan Yu was worshipped in China. That's quite a lot more by a factor of 100 than the, uh, the Confucian temple. Even the smallest village would have a, a shrine to him, and well-off families would have a corner of their house uh, or a little shrine in their complex, which would be uh, holding a portrait or a statue of Kuan Yu. And Hong Kong, it's interesting, it's a bit of irony here. In Hong Kong, the triads, the famous criminal gang in Hong Kong that controlled the, uh, the drug trade, the triads worship Kuan Yu, and so do the police. And we try to catch the try. So he's uh, he's favoured by both sides of the equation. Now, what are these magical powers? What does he have to offer Saint uh, Kuan Yu up there in heaven? Well, at the Battle of Lake Poyan, this is in 1363, part of the, the downfall of the Yuan Dynasty and the rise of the Ming Dynasty, was one of the world's biggest sea battles. Uh, Zhu Guanzhan led the Ming Navy against the Han Navy, one of the largest battles in naval history, on a giant inland lake, Lake Point. Zhu won the battle, and he became Hongu, the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty. Oh, sorry, the, yeah, the first emperor uh, yeah, of the Ming Dynasty. Now, Kuan Yu's spirit is said to have appeared and helped Zhu to victory. That is, of course, uh, to students of world history, this is not the first time that somebody is said to have appeared and led somebody in victory over another army. It seems to have happened a few times and since. Now the Yongle Emperor in the 1400s said that he had also been guided and helped by Kuan Yu when seizing power from his nephew, the Dragon Emperor, in a coup d'etat. So we've got at least two examples in China of uh, where this uh, Kuan Yu has come in his uh, spirit form to help in his army. And this now brings us very close to why he became worshipped or revered in Korea. During the Imjin Wars, or the Imjin Weran, or the Hideyoshi invasions of Korea, in the late 16th century, so 1592 to 1598, Ming China sent armies and navies to Korea to help draw some Korea fight off the, uh, the Japanese. Now there is some murkiness here. A couple of different stories that vary with each other. One of them is that Kuan Yu's spirit helped Ming China in general. He just generally appeared at the scene of battles and, and led them in to China and helped them to overcome. Other accounts, and these are Korean accounts, refer to General Chin or Jinin. And the uh, online uh, Shilok, the, uh, the record of the king, uh, gives the Chinese characters as this, as Jin Jiangmu uh, or Jinin, and it has a story about him being wounded by a Japanese bullet at the siege of Ulta, which is in, uh, towards the end of the Imjin War, so 1597 to 15. And then retreating to Seoul for treatment, and he was healed by praying to Kuan Yu. That's the Korean version of the story, the official Korean version of the story. Now, the other version we have is that there was a Chen Lin who has a different, two possible different uh, uh, hunter for his name, who was the Ming Admiral. And he wasn't at the Battle of Ulsa, he was fighting in ships alongside uh, Korean Admiral Yi Chun Shin at the Battle of Noryangjin, right at the very end of the, uh, the Hideyoshi Invasion, in December of 1598, and it was he, this uh, Admiral Chen Lin, who gave a eulogy at Jin's funeral. However, I can't find any account of him having been shot or otherwise wounded by the Japanese, or of having had a vision of, uh, of Kuan Yu in any form. So we've got three different versions here, uh, and I can't find one that seems to be the authoritative version. I also looked at uh, Sam Hawley's account of the Indian War. Sam a, uh, a former member of the, uh, the Royal Asian Society, and his book is up the back there for sale. It's an excellent book on the Indian War. Unfortunately, he doesn't mention Kuan Yu either, or the shrines that appeal, appeared uh, after the Indian War and were voted for him. So I imagine that this could be the, uh, uh, the missing chapter from his book on how Kuan Yu became involved. So, Korean shrines. Right after, during the, uh, the Indian War, uh, Indian Wars, the Ming 
soldiers were fighting the Japanese, they wrecked the first tribe as a guardian spirit or a deity. And we've got them in locations of diverse of Tol, Andong, Tongju, Bogundong, the small island off the coast of Guadalupe, Namwan, Songne, etc. We've got them in several different places. And these were the first one one mil. And there's another uh, mismite in uh, English that could be a W, not a G. One one mil, the shrine to King One. So after the Indian Wars, the Ming Emperor Shenzhong and Chosun King Songjo agreed to join forces, join, when I say join forces, I mean here uh, money and talent, manpower, to build a big and proper shrine in Hanyu. And so the first of these shrines, the first proper state controlled shrine, was the Nam Wan Wan Myo, what we call in short Nam Myo, or the Southern Shrine. So here we see a table that shows all four of them. We've got Nam Kwan Wan Yo, which was uh, established in 1598, so it's right at the end of the wars. And if this date is correct, April 1598, then it was too early for the Battle of Noryang, at which Admiral Chen appeared. Uh, it, it would make sense for the Battle of, uh, of Ulsan, or the Siege of Ulsan, because that was December 1597 to January, uh, February 1598. So that could make if that name's true. Now, where was this? This is in Chungu Donong Ilgan uh, number 68, which is actually more or less across the road from where Seoul Station is. Uh, what is now the car park of the Millennium Hilton Hotel. That is where the Nam Kwan Wan Myo was, the very first one. Uh, shortly afterwards, just three years later, was the Dong Kwan Wan Myo. And that's over in Sumin Dong. Uh, and if you look at maps, and I'll show you a map of it later on, what it looks like. That is still the same piece of land. So Dong Kwan Wan is the only shrine to Kwan, uh, to Kwan Wan in Seoul that is still at the same place. It still occupies that area. We've also got later on the Kuk Kwan Wan Myo, which was the North Shrine, and that was established in 1883 uh, on a, a site which is almost as big as that of Dong Wan. It's about 2,000 square meters in King Song. And then we've got one over in the west, which was uh, Todemundu, and that's almost the same size. Now, two of these, the East Shrine and the North Shrine, both of them were in, in Dongwon. I'll come to a bit about that later on. Look at these two dates, because that's significant. Look at how, look at how late they were established. Uh, we're talking about almost 300 years after the first shrine. That's interesting. So, as I point out here, the West and North Shrines were erected during the, shrine, the reign of King Bojo. Kuan Yu worship, this is when the, the folk religions, the worship of Kuan Yu became more important and more prominent uh, in, during, during the reign of King Bojo. Perhaps, well, why, why, could, why is it the case? It could be that Bojo felt that uh, with the, uh, the opening of Korea, the unfair treaty, the arrival of Western nations, uh, the Japanese fighting the Chinese and comparing to King Korea, that maybe it's because Korea was at a time of crisis, similar to during the Indian Wars, and that's why these shrines were built to call upon Kuan Yu to help, to lead Korea out of its crisis and into a, uh, a stable period, such as happened after the Indian War. And note that what's really interesting is that the last shrine, the back of that, which is the, the one in the west, Sumi Myo, or Song Myo, the last of them was established in 1903, which is well after uh, the um, Sino-Japanese War, in, in which uh, Korea obtained her independence from Qingdu from China. It's very interesting that they had a, a shrine to a Chinese god built in Korea quite a while after uh, independence from China. And uh, according to the records, Queen Min, the uh, Empress Gyeongsong, and two of the Japsan that are on top of the main shrine, because Japsan are always on top of buildings that uh, were used by the royal court. So the indication of Songyu was of importance. Now, just a few years ago, in October 2011, during preservation work, they found a very rare painting, which had been hidden, possibly for 400 years, behind a folding screen that stood behind the statue of Kwan, uh, yeah, Kwan Wan. Sorry, Kwan Yu. I'll show you a picture of that, uh, the first folding screen. Right. There's the folding screen there, right, which you, if you've been to a palace, you'll recognize this painting. Five mountain tops, and then the red sun and the white moon. If you go back, this is called the Il Wan Ho Mong Yo, right? which is behind every royal throne. You've got the sun, the moon, and the five mountains. Uh, but behind that, so in 2011, they took this 
the screen now. And there behind it, they found paintings with Fuji Fuji on door. It's made it's very big. It's taller than I am, so it's 2.75 meters tall and almost five meters wide, which features one white dragon, one blue dragon, and seven yellow dragons. So it's a nine dragon figure. A dragon, of course, being uh, symbolic of kings during the years, of course. And it's the only one of its kind. And because it had been hidden for 400 years behind the screen, it's been basically untouched, A, by human hands, and B, by human breath, and C, by air around it. So it's in fantastic condition. So here's some pictures of it. That is the, the picture of the screen, uh, of the painting behind the screen. <coughs> See, here is uh, one of the dragons. So uh, having found this uh, this painting, they measured it, they studied it, they took photographs of it, and then they put the old screen uh, back in front of it again, so it's no longer visible to the public. So go to Dongyo today. A, you can't get inside the shrine anyway, and B, even if you could get inside the shrine, all you would see would be the old painting, uh, the screen of the uh, the sun, the moon, the five peaks. So all you've got is these photographs that I dug up from the uh, the source and book. Plus, uh, anyone who's interested later on, I've got this book. Uh, on the preservation work at Dongno, which is put together by Dongno Gu Office, because Dongno Gu Office owns the shrine, uh, and there's some wonderful pictures in there of the uh, the restoration work that's inside the shrine. So, these are some more pictures. So, it's a great place to go, both if you're interested in the flea market, if you're not, just go there, because it's free to get in, and it's, like, as I said, it's really quiet, because it's uh, not a tourist attraction. Uh, the fourth and last place I'd like to do is this Nam Wan Wan Yo, or the Namyo, and that's now in Sadango. Now you'll see on the map here, uh, I got went to the east of the station, took a mile bus, and then walked the rest of the way. And you can see at the very top here, this is where Park Chung Hee, President Park's uh, tomb is. Right? So this is just over the hill from the uh, Chung Chung Wan uh, National Cemetery. Uh, so literally a stone's throw from uh, President Park <coughs> is where uh, the uh, the saintly god Kuan Yin is uh, is enshrined, and it looks like that. This is my wife going inside. This is a Nam Nyo, as it's uh, known. Now, this is again, as I said before, it's privately run and has been for over the last hundred years since a private foundation took over. So there's no touristiness here at all. You've been to the shrine; the door is open, uh, but it's not. I'll say the door is ajar. It's not wide open, it's not welcoming, but they're not locking you out either. So if you push the gate open, you can get in. Uh, and you can go inside. This is the main shrine building. The photos are not allowed. So I was not able to get any photographs of um, the, uh, the portrait <coughs> of the uh, Numbers and Hangul written on the stone show when the thing was moved brick by brick, stone by stone, in 1979. Right? You can just make it out there. But uh, Ra, Wan, Da, Wan, etc. So there, uh, no one bothered to, uh, to wipe the chalk off uh, when the thing was moved almost 40 years ago. Okay, you'll see there's some, uh, a residential house behind it. Uh, this is looking back at the gate from inside. Uh, there's another building there. Uh, I'm not sure what this is, but this one here on the left, this is where the caretaker's house is. Oops, there's no R there. I have to go in and make those up. Uh, I had to go to the caretaker's house and knock on the door to get the caretaker to come out and talk to me because, as I said, there's no explanatory signs there, so I really wanted to talk to somebody. Uh, and luckily, it was on a weekend, and the caretaker was home. Uh, he was having a nap. I woke him up, uh, but he came out straight to me and spoke to me for a while. Fascinating fellow. He's in his 80s, uh, and he has, he has ears with incredibly long lobes of the kind that you would see in portraits of Confucius or, or Buddha. Uh, he has these, I've never seen such low before. I actually was looking at his ear for quite a while wondering, is that real? Is this <laughs> Fascinating. Anyway, uh, here are the, the, the uh, stones that have been taken from the original Namyo. This one here says um, unauthorized uh, access not allowed. So don't set up. This is actually the sign that says uh, dead and bombing, so meaning there's a private foundation. And this one, I can't read the bottom handle there, but it says uh, whether you're big or small. Normally, it's a whether you're big or small, get off your horse. Uh, but the last two characters are not get off your horse, so I don't know what that means. Maybe someone can tell me later. As I did say there's no sign inside the shrine or in front. That's true. The only sign I could find was 
on the very top of the mountain behind the shrine between uh, President Park and the shrine. So this is a, uh, a nature trail and this is a, uh, uh, an information board about not only Mount York but about mm -hmm. the cemetery and about a couple of other historical items that are really interesting to have a look at. Yeah, the caretaker over 80 years old, uh, his father played a big role in uh, making sure that the shrine, the original shrine, wasn't destroyed back in the early 1900s. So his father uh, was, was part of the Civic Foundation that took over the, the, uh, the shrine. And he told me that this uh, job of uh, both the caretaker and the worshipper, like the venerator of Huang was a position that had been passed down from father to son for many generations. So apparently his family had been doing it for several hundred years. Uh, but as for he's now in his 80s, looks reasonably healthy. I asked him if he had a son. He said he does, but there's no guarantee that the son will take over. And he said that's a question that we leave up to the foundation. So one wonders whether the whole thing might not just die uh, when he dies, whether the foundation even has the money to continue to pay someone to do these monthly worship permits, which does still do monthly uh, care times for Kuan Yu inside the Mount York. Uh, but it's a very interesting open question. As I said, the, well, it's up on top of the mountain. It's absolutely beautiful. The house is nice. I wouldn't mind living there for free for doing a couple of hours of Kuan Yu every month, but they're not going to pick me, so. <laughs> Inside of the gate, so we've got the Huang Tong Yo, so the, uh, uh, the shrine to Holy Saint Huang. Now, we come to an interesting story. This is a story that I heard from the caretaker of Nam Yo. He said that there are different images of, of Huang Yo depending on whether he's alive or whether he's dead. The story that he told me, uh, which is related to one of the three narratives I mentioned earlier, was Chinese General Jin Yin was wounded, he was taken to Seoul. Kuan Yu appeared. He appeared, he rose from the ground outside Nandan and appeared, flew over Seoul and went back into the ground outside Dongden. And this is why, according to the story, this is why the Nam Yo was built outside Nandan and the Dong Yo was built outside Dongden. And the figure in Nam Yo represents the living Kuan Yu, the Kuan Yu rising out of the ground. And the figure in Dong Yo represents the dead Kuan Yu after he's killed going back into the ground. And that's why there are different colors, he said. So it's a clear living, the living image of Kuan Yu, where the face is red, the clothes are green, and um, these are the pictures that we see of the, or these images that we see of the, in both Nam Yo and Dong Yo, the North and South Shrine, uh, the, the living Kuan Yu. The death image of Kuan Yu, this is the same statue I showed you before inside Dong but now it's wearing the yellow robe. The face and body of gold, Colors are yellow, the imperial color, but he's only emperor in death, up in the heavens, not during his lifetime. During his lifetime, he's a general, so he's wearing his general's armor and uh, his general's green robe. But in death, he wears the uh, yellow. And only his beard is the same as his living image. Uh, and only the Dongyo statue is like this. What the statue was like in Songyo, I couldn't find a record of. But what's interesting is that this is a story I've heard, but according to the, uh, the book that I've got, PDF file, if anyone who's interested, I'll send it to you later. I'm still in Korean. The report on Beijing's academic investigation into relics held at Dong Kwan Wan Myo, which is part of Mount York, put together by Dong Myo Duo Office, they say that this is all a bunch of hokum. The appellations living image of Kwan Myo and death image of Kwan Myo are both beliefs passed down from the 18th century, but this is not correct according to iconic basis, historical discretion, or academics. Furthermore, in China, images or statues of Kwan Myo are not distinguished in this way. So perhaps it's something that's only true in Korea, or maybe it is just a more recent folk belief that came up in the 18th century that didn't exist for the first uh, couple of hundred years. So it's an interesting one. Now, how is it that Kuan Yu Shrine, once important and popular, has come to be so desecrated? No, you ask any Korean these days, most people have either never been to Dongyo or they think you're talking about Jongyo and mispronounce it. Maybe it's because Kuan Yu was a god that came from China. Maybe that's why he's not quite so popular. But, here's a question. Haven't most figures worshipped in Korea, and indeed most religions, come to Korea from overseas? Right? Not just Kuan Yu, but Confucius, Jesus, Buddha, all of them, coming from outside. Uh, so Kuan Yu and the folk religions around him have come to be part of Korea's traditions too. They're not just China, but they're also part of Korea's traditions. 
least the last uh, 500 years, almost. But I did find this quote in the uh, previous report that I mentioned by the Seoul Metropolitan Government. On the other hand, today is China's campaign to revive Sino's letters in the throwing, Dongyo, and trying to Chinese vote Hanyu, is also seen in an uncomfortable way. Seen from that perspective, Dongyo and the relics held in it clearly have value as a weighted heritage. I had this trouble translating that one. The uh, Bu is here, sorry, the, uh, the Bu. Uh, anyway, weighted heritage, carrying the significant message that history must not be repeated. In other words, we must never have another Kuan Yu foisted on us uh, by the Chinese again. And that's uh, uh, something I'll leave you with food for thought. I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes. Uh, ever since I, I discovered the, the Jiegang Yo many years ago on Namsan Mountain, facing towards downtown Seoul, yep. I thought that was the original Nam Yo. I had always thought for years uh, because it's this perfect location and it's very much the same. Uh, can you tell what is the relationship between these shrines and the Jiegang Yo? That's a good question. I think it is it also not called the Wara Waryongyo, right? That's up on Namsan. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's in in that particular shrine. It's not just Chega, but also two other uh, generals who fought under Liu Bei. You got the Chega, um, Yu Bi. Yu Bi. Well, the Yu Bi is Liu Bei. That he's the warlord. But there are two other ones that uh, Chang Bi or Chang Bei and Quan uh, Yu. So three of these generals are all enshrined in that. Particular couldn't find as much uh, detail about that one in what I was reading about, so it's not directly related to one of Kuan Yu's shrines. Kuan Yu just happens to be in it, but it's not a shrine just for him. But yeah, it's certainly one uh, on a more extensive research. I'd like to include the uh, the, the Waiyong Mill as well uh, and look at how that relates to it. That also has the, the Yellow Emperor and Dan Yun and Akari in it, so it's a real you know China Korea combination. Wow. You know if they still do uh, a ceremony there? Uh, it's privately operated, and uh, they have big people for worship all the time. Mm -hmm. Large scale temples. We should do another presentation. I'm not sure. I agree. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, good question. My master's degree has absolutely nothing to do with this at all. Uh, my thesis will be written on North Korean comic books or graphic novels. Uh, this is just a side interest. This semester at uh, Cordial University, I've been studying as an exchange student with three universities. And so I took a class in um, the culture and history of Seoul. And so we were all told uh, to go out and visit some place in struggle area and do a report on it. And I, I was so interested in the Kuan Yu uh, story and the shrines and what happened to them and why it's been so well forgotten that I decided to, uh, to do a presentation because there's very, very little written about him in English. Right? The last substantive thing that I could find about him written in English was a report written, a monogram, written by a German professor whose name escapes me. He's now deceased. And I was not able to find either an online or offline copy of that report anywhere uh, in Korea. There is, however, in the next days or weeks, uh, a new paper about to come out about Kuan Yu in English, which is completely coincidental, uh, happens to come out the same month as my uh, paper, uh, my presentation, rather. Here's the abstract. Uh, scholarship on Joseon gratitude to the Ming in the wake of the Imjin Wars stresses Joseon loyalism and a nostalgia for a lost civilizational order then only remnant as a final human outpost on the Korean Peninsula, standing firm before the tides of northern territory. There was a very different undercurrent, however, in which the Chosun officialdom of the capital saw the Ming as irrational and culturally alien, if not barbarous, violators of propriety. This paper examines these tensions and contradictions through the construction of Chosun State Temples to Kuan Yu, known in his deified form as Kuan Wan, at the close of the 16th century, 
and the roles the cult and its temple played as a discursive space in which the Ming and Chaucer governments negotiated the nature and dynamics of their relationship. Uh, it sounds like something that would fit in very nicely into what I've been looking at, but it's not yet available uh, online or offline, so I'll have to wait uh, for that one to come and hopefully provide some more answers. Maybe we can answer about the Jekal, uh, the, the shrine there at Wai Gong. No, no answers there? Okay, oh, right, right. we have someone who has actually read the paper. Uh, there's no answer about Wai Gong. That's a good question, McKee. Yeah, he's not he's not a Confucian scholar, so why would he be enshrined? Yes, that's a good question. Um, and why also would he receive a Bodhisattva name? Because he's also revered to a certain extent within Buddhism. Uh, what I would suggest is that in Confucianism, what it appeals is his sense of loyalty, propriety, morality, and ethics, and that slots into uh, the uh, the Confucian values there. But he himself, he wasn't a scholar. He presents the uh, the military arm. I guess, of, of the young one, not the scholarly one, but uh, uh, yeah, that, it's certainly a contradiction there, an interesting one. Brother <laughs> Anthony. Uh, when John Perry Hall visited Seoul in 1882, probably the, maybe the first question there, <coughs> he wasn't allowed to enter through Nandewa, and he was escorted by Chinese soldiers around Mount San over the top, and he went down to Dongmyo, which was serving as the uh, barracks for the Chinese forces. Wow. <coughs> did you know that? No, I did not. Uh, in 1882, you say? In which year was uh, the Taewangun kidnapped by the Chinese and taken off the street? Is it the 90s? Okay, because I was told at that time, and maybe you know this as well, uh, we were told uh, that the Chinese were at that time garrisoned at what is now Camp Koina, that's the Mongol house, uh, just north of uh, Yorktown main garrison. So unless they were at both Dongmyo and Camp Koina, which is Guangdong, uh, then I don't know how to account for that. Uh, sorry. I'd like